Spanner starts out using the red in his latest approach. He earlier actually mentioned using the difference between the turn intensity and green. We tried all three, swept the parameter, and looked at accuracy. The best result was for the blue was 84% and 21% coverage. For the color and variant method that I mentioned earlier from the aerial imagery, we had a 97% correctness. We realized a 13% gain in, uh, in terms of its correctness for labeling, uh, for labeling stuff not building. In addition to that, we had 10% more coverage uh, for the Fairfield data set. I can only compare with the NDVI with the Fairfield because that was the only data set that had the uh, return light in the Anchorage did not. And then there's the parameters as well for the meaning. Uh, when I saw this, I was kind of in shock, scratched my head, and really had to think, I had to go back and check the code. Is it really 97%? It's a 97% isn't something that I see very often. But again, it's pseudo-correctness. We didn't know where the vegetation actually existed. Uh, okay, so here's the color and variant for where it identifies the, the vegetation. So like, there's a giant part here. It actually has trouble identifying the dark side of the vegetation, but it did identify the sun side of the vegetation. Um, and then here's like an actual zoomed in version where you can see uh, the aerial image for residential buildings in the Fairfield data set and where it made this vegetation as well. Uh, then we wind up evaluating the algorithm's results on a per pixel level for how the end result will end up classifying buildings. Uh, the red is good. This was identified as a building in both the true positive and false positive case. The, um, the blue is indifferent. Neither set identified as a building. And then finally, the uh, false negative is the orange. And the, I'm sorry, the false negative is green and the false positive is orange. For the most part, we do have some um, false negatives for some of the smaller buildings and the residential buildings, that, but we do detect some of those smaller buildings. And at the same time, um, for the uh, false positive, we have sometimes we have trouble with the uh, uh, vegetation as well as the adjacent to buildings. Nick, go back to the previous uh, figure again. <coughs> so can you just explain what these techniques are presented? Um, uh, this picture on the uh, right is the aerial imagery. This is the luminosity of the scene. This is the original imagery. This uh, picture on the left, the white pixel actually corresponds to what the algorithm is labeling as vegetation. So we left, if it was non-vegetation, the algorithm didn't call it vegetation. It was luminosity that occurred. Using the combined LIDAR and aerial photography technique? Oh, uh, no, this is not the end of the This is the aerial. Yeah, the, 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 the color invariant method just works off the aerial imagery. Right. It, the NDVI works off of both. I didn't show the results to the NDVI. Uh, one thing I guess I can say about the NDVI is um, it actually labeled uh, this building right here as a, um, uh, it labeled it as uh, vegetation uh, for whatever reason. It might have to do with the spectral properties, of how the LIDAR interacted that and all of a sudden commonly aligned it with the other ones. And I, this is infinitely infuriating because combining an 84% accuracy with a LiDAR, uh, with a building detection for LiDAR data that already has a 92%, it drove down it and only raised the correctness up a little bit. So then I went back and got this color invariant method, which did wind up improving the correctness a little bit with little drawback on the uh, completeness measure. Um, okay, and this, I said, uh, 92% completeness and 82% correctness for the Fairfield. 89.75 for the anchor, which wound up being pretty competitive with the results in the uh, that are presented in the literature. But these are the global. Let's go over as a function of the building size. Oh wait, oh, before I get to that, I'm ahead of myself. Is uh, this is the classification of the end result as well? Uh, red corresponds to grass. Uh, yellow corresponds to um, uh, mostly trees. The and then the orange is building and um, the green is ground. One thing that I was particularly pleased about with the pseudo-homophy tree is it did a good job at identifying the ground. And that has an application in the development of digital terrain models where we try to identify the ground and then remove everything else that's in it. So what kind of uh, conclusions do you draw from this picture? Um, first thing we did, uh, did a pretty good job at identifying the ground, but I mainly went back and looked at this as a reference set. There weren't a lot of areas that were ground and mistaken as something else, which I was really pleased. I already went over the accuracy of the building in the previous um, approach, but then again, also you can see where there are parks. Uh, a lot of those parks or those uh, areas also correspond um, to the vegetation. We label those as uh, grass in this classification. So, do you have a measure as to? Uh, what we have identified as green is ground, it's fully ground. The only thing is, if you call it a building ground, then we penalize you accordingly. But um, if, uh, if, yeah, and as well as uh, if you call it something, uh, like if you call, if any of these other classes were called building, 
then um, that wound up being represented in the previous results as a penalty in terms of its correctness. But I didn't I mean, mean you only calculated whether it was building or, or not, not building. building. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So those statistics are only based on that. Uh, yes. On how well you classified grass versus correct versus dirt versus trees. Or whatever. Correct. Um, now we present the the algorithm uh, results. It's completeness and correctness as a function of the building site. What you'll see here is kind of a, a transient response, if you will. After this point, then at the um, transient response. There was an electrical engineering term. I apologize for no schematics throughout the entire course of this dissertation. <laughs> um, a transient response uh, here, and the response was pretty much the same after uh, larger than this. The one on the left is a uh, completeness and correctness for the range on the x-axis. So you can see for um, like uh, values having a, uh, a buildings have a size greater than 130 meters squared and less than 190, wind up having like a 70% correctness and 80% um, completeness. The cumulative completeness and correctness is like for uh, values having um, for values having a uh, for buildings having a size of 150 meters squared or greater, we wound up realizing a completeness of 93% uh, and a correctness of 87%. I thought you were using a minimum building size of 40 meters. Um, right. Yes. Sometimes. So how could something be classified as a building if it's less than 40? Sometimes there was a larger region that encompassed those smaller regions. So it wind up having a penalty for its uh, uh, correctness. That's why the correctness kind of is really low for those uh, lower buildings. And then past 250, it's it was pretty flat. Yeah, it was about the same after 250. Um, and then here is the, uh, the size for the anchorage data set. The fair field was a little bit better than the uh, anchorage data set. I speculate because the uh, uh, point density was greater for the Fairfield, and therefore the Fairfield law being a little bit better. Again, the, the National Homeowner Association said the average size hall was about 230 meters squared, to put that in perspective. Um, so then we wind up comparison, uh, comparing our approaches to other methods. Uh, I wind up looking at Bosselman, Latanik, and Rottensteiners, uh, among other papers that are surveyed. We compare our method with uh, at several stages of the algorithm, and then finally I'll prepare these uh, comparison at the end results of the algorithm. But um, Rottenstein wound up having an 87 to 91% completeness, and then um, uh, Vossel and Matanikin, 80% and 90 and 90 85%. Matanikin's actual point density was significantly denser than ours, um, as Vossel was about the same, and then Rottensteiner, Rottensteiner actually, his uh, paper, he tested his on the Fairfield data set. This is like an apples to apples comparison to provide our test for the Fairfield data set, for the Anchorage data set, which he didn't have. Uh, Rottensteiner will wind up, um, uh, and all the approaches will wind up requiring the interpolation of LiDAR data, and then uh, two of those approaches wind up requiring manual registration. In comparing directly to Rothstein, I mentioned a parameter that he had earlier that is directly based on the value of the data set, and that parameter is, for whatever reason, he wants you to estimate the percentage of vegetation existent in the data set, and that percentage has to be within 5% of the ground truth in order to reproduce his results presented in the paper. And it's based, and that uh, parameter is winds up influencing one of the uh, probability mass functions that he winds up. It's based on actually that parameter. When you say you're comparing the other methods, can you be a little clearer on what oh. the other methods are using with respect to source, right? Um, are they using aerophotography or LIDAR or the combination? Vosselman? And what are you, what, what are you comparing that to? Because right? mm -hmm. you've got three different ways of calculating the result as well. Um, these results are the end results. Uh, using both the combination thereof. Okay. Um, can only uses the LIDAR. Rottensteiner and Vossel will use both. Okay. Um, and your results are using both. Yes, correct. Uh, but I do have my results in the dissertation for using only single ones. Right. Yeah, as well. I just didn't know which one's your mm -hmm. um, So let's go over some of the contributions of the various uh, things presented. First, we wind up contributing a building detection from a uh, LiDAR approach with a proposed use of pseudo Monte trees, which hasn't been utilized before for this application. Uh, we also wind up working, this approach, approach works off of the irregular LiDAR data, which seems to be rather rare as most of the approaches are employing the use of conventional image processing techniques and interpolating them instead. Um, and then furthermore, the algorithm is a tertiary classifier for just LiDAR data, where we do identify the ground and the non-building building with just the LiDAR data, and we realize the competitive performance with what's uh, existing in the recent literature. For the uh, 
aerial imagery, we wind up contributing a color segmentation technique as well as a shadow vegetation and building identification technique. Um, it's a tertiary classifier, and we'll identify uh, non-building that's mostly pavement, and then vegetation, which is the trees and grass, and then uh, building. And it'll have actually a competitive performance with uh, other methods that are recently in the literature. Again, the LiDAR wound up, just from the LiDAR, wound up doing better computer imagery. There's a lot of uh, conflicting information in the aerial imagery, and a lot of the approaches that I looked at were on par with what we wind up presenting in our comparison, uh, which is pretty interesting. It seems like it's just automating the approach and just looking at the single meter area image is a pretty big challenge at the moment. And then we want to contribute this registration method. I'm uh, particularly happy about the registration method as well as uh, some of the others. Uh, that with the space correlation approach, not only can we handle the translation rotation and scaling and they don't have to completely overlap, but you'll, the, um, the accuracies from the two different perspective methods were different. In other words, like there are buildings that are being, there are entities that are being identified as building in the uh, aerial imagery, and those same entities are not being identified as building the here. We don't have perfect maps, and those perfect maps don't perfectly coincide with one another. But because it's a correlation approach, we can still get the registration out of it. Um, if I did find, though, is if you wind up drastically differing them, um, then this winds up influencing the result, as well as, of course, if you start to get less and less, significantly less overlap than what was presented. Uh, we'll also have trouble with the, the phase correlation. We'll have worse and worse trouble as those conditions worsen. Um, as, a, as part of this contributed system, the goal here is we want to provide the maximum end flexibility to the user. I don't want to ship like we don't want to ship a commercial package. Oh, by the way, you need Photoshop and MATLAB to register this stuff to get together. We want to automatically register them together for it, and we want to provide the information as it is available. I mean, uh, we, in the building detection from LIDAR approach, we didn't cover in the dissertation there's some additional assumptions we can implement if you have both the first and last return data. If you have just the first or the last, then we'll uh, restrict it to just that and work with what you have available. If you have the LIDAR and the aerial imagery uh, both available, we can do stuff if you just have this, either of them will work with just either of them. Uh, Harris has been absolutely phenomenal in helping us out with this. Um, I go to their tech, I say I go to their technical seminars, and they somehow magically provide eight PhDs to critique my work there. And, and it's not only a matter of critiquing their work and providing me with feedback and a way to adjust it so that it aligns to the industry's interest, but then I get to share my experience with the rest of these scientists. And they have also funded, uh, help in providing us with funding, which is a great help, so that we can purchase the applied imagery uh, quick terrain modeler software, as well as showcase our uh, technique at conference, and prevent me from starting. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Claude and Robert Steiner and Ian Hatch for the Fairfield and Mr. John Ellis and Aerobat for the uh, Anchor Data Center and my chair and committee members. And one last thing I guess I want to throw us through is uh, the dissertation does a really good job of documenting this and I showed this, uh, this wonderful awesome theory. It actually accounted at the end of the day and it took me 14,000 lines of code to implement this. Um, there's a lot of comedy in there and the reason there's a lot of comedy in there is because I work with triangulation and then all of a sudden I test another data set and there's like all of a sudden a point being inserted exactly on the triangle's edge that I didn't anticipate. I have to go back and modify that code a year later. I better understand what I was doing at the time. Um, I'm sure if I were to recode it, it might be like 10,000 lines of code. I've certainly improved along the way. But even the 10,000 lines of code, it's like when you break the images apart to part, to, uh, to, to part and then you bring them back together, there's a MapBox script behind that that automatically accomplishes that. There's, um, I manually extract 3,000 uh, LiDAR po uh, points uh, quick terrain model will store them in a separate file, I've got to make a file that condenses them back together again. So there's those, it stinks that legwork too when you develop a, fair, a reader for the Fairfield data set that doesn't have an even number of columns that can't be read through MATLAB and Excel. There's, nobody cares about that in academia. It's like, good job, this is expected, uh, here you go. And there's a little bit of that legwork to make this match happen. Yeah. But um, does anyone have any questions? One is um, on the LiDAR data itself, right? You jumped into using.